My name is Roger Hunter. I'm the coordinator of the Couch and Watershed Board. I'd like to welcome you all here uh, to this incredible watershed and, and to the traditional territory of Couch and Tribes. And, and we thank Couch and Tribes for the wonderful, uh, uh, harmonious way in which uh, people interact and, and for time on this wonderful traditional territory. So the title of this is, if I've got it right, and I think that probably Oliver Brandis named this, he's calling it uh, the Cowichan Experience, an Adventure in Governance Evolution. And it is an adventure, and it is about evolution, and there's some pretty neat things happening here in the couch and in this wondrous watershed. I don't know, uh, how many of you, don't see that many, came on the field trip that we had on Sunday? <laughs> Only one. Well, it's a pretty uh, crazy, amazing watershed, and you're going to see uh, some beautiful slides. You're going to see uh, some issues that we face. Rob Hutchins is going to talk about the big picture, uh, and then he's going to talk about how we're looking at it in the couch and from a general perspective. And then we thought it would be useful if you got the perspective of some of the people who are involved with the watershed board. So Larry George is gonna give you a bit of a couch and perspective on the watershed board. Uh, Andy Thompson from DFO is gonna talk about what, what DFO, what they see as the benefits of this and why they're involved. And then Lorna Med, who used to be our regional health officer here, is going to talk about things from a public health perspective. And then finally, David Anderson, I think, is going to reflect a little bit on senior government. Interesting term, senior government. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll all uh, uh, profit from this. What we'd like to do, of course, is tell you our story and then learn from you. And if there are things that we can offer you in the, in the question and answer period, then we'll gladly do that. But we're, we're hoping to glean some knowledge from, from your experiences. So we'll begin with Rob Hutchins, and he's going to give you the big overview. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, and thank you for uh, joining us here to, uh, to hear our story about um, an effort towards local government, local initiative towards watershed governance. Uh, I'm glad you're here because um, John Reardon this morning in his uh, review of yesterday uh, reflected on the fact that um, only if there is provincial legislation and the divestation of uh, provincial authority to local is it of any meaningful if it's of any meaning to us and uh, I think he used the words and I believe he was reflecting on Chief Lydia Whitsum's description of our efforts as um, it's a nice thing to do and I was hoping John would be here because uh, I think the story that you're going to hear is that um, in the face of climate change, in the face of population pressure, in the face of the retreat, in particular the provincial government, we have no choice to step forward. And that we are taking some significant positive steps to do the right thing, regardless of whether we have legislative authority from the province of British Columbia. So in the terms of the context, uh, for those that are not familiar with uh, this part of the world, uh, the Cowichan Watershed is part of the Cowichan Valley Regional District. And our district uh, stretches from uh, the east coast of Vancouver Island, the Baldies Island actually, the Gulf Islands, to the mouth of the Nitnat. It starts uh, the in the southern, at the top of the Malahat, and it goes to the Nanaimo Airport, uh, just uh, north of Ladysmith. Uh, we are 82,000 people strong. And if you're in familiar with the regional districts of the province of British Columbia, we're 10th in size. There's 28 regional districts in the province of uh, British Columbia. We're 10th in size in terms of population. 
but our uh, some 800,000 acres were actually about um, 23rd in size. Most of the interior regional districts, of course, great vast stretches of land. Now, the couch and watershed is a critical part of our region. In fact, it takes up about 30%. It's 980 uh, square miles. And Couch and Lake is 32 kilometers long, and it's the second longest, largest river on, uh, sorry, lake on Vancouver Island. And uh, it empties into the Couch and River, which flows about 50 kilometers to Couch and Bay. Now, what's so unusual about our river system and lake system is the phenomenal change in precipitation from one end to the other. On the western side, typically we would get five meters of rain in a year. Five meters. However, as we move down into this part of the valley and the coastal floodplain, we typically get about 800 millimeters, less than a meter of rain. So a phenomenal difference in precipitation levels. So for a thousand years, and you've heard some of the stories from our elders and from the Cowichan tribes, that uh, they occupied this basin. Not only Cowichan tribes, but it was also home to the traditional territory, especially Lake Cowichan area, to the Cowichan Lake tribe, and also to the Dididac. We are 82,000 people strong, but I can tell you the First Nations were numbered in the tens of thousands in the Cowichan Valley before the, before the first contact. The Dididat on Nate, Lake Nidnat were 8,000 people strong. The first contact with smallpox destroyed 5,000 people. The next contact killed 3,000 people. In a very short space of time, they went from 8,000 to 200. They're now back up to about 600. The Cowichan tribes used to number over 15,000. They were also decimated by the smallpox. And their figures, on my understanding, and uh, Larry George could help me on this, I believe their population went down to about 2,000, 2,200. It's now about back up to about 4,500. During the four, five thousand, six, or 7,000 years that they occupied this valley, of course, it was dominated by um, first growth forest, gigantic Douglas fir, hemlock, and cedar. I'm not sure why there's ever the, um, why I cannot read this on my screen here. So I have to keep turning to look at the scene. If there is a audio guy or a techie guy around, that'd be great. Uh, the Cowichan River was in such abundance in terms of the salmon that during the 1930s and the 20s, the actual salmon runs of the Cowichan River made headlines, front page headlines in the London Times, an ocean and a continent away. We had tidal flats uh, abundant with shellfish, and as I said, the villages, the great village of the Cowichan and the other First Nations um, were huge. Unfortunately, over the last 150 years, we have not been so kind. I've heard some criticism of uh, the present logging practices. However, the logging practices of the first hundred years were far worse than they are now. We literally clear-cutted this valley from one end to the other. Um, <coughs> and so what we have left with is we have largely second growth timber, young forest, the clear cuts we are and have now, and you can witness them now, they're far smaller than they used to be, but they're still there. As we built our communities and generated wealth, we uh, certainly did harm. With climate change, we've also noticed, and uh, Cowichan Tribes has had a fish hatchery on the mouth of the Cowichan uh, River uh, since early 1980s, and that water feeding that fish hatchery is monitored on a regular basis, and we have, my understanding is that the 
temperature change has gone up one and a half degrees in the last 32 years. And since the uh, mid-1960s, the shellfish beds of Cowichan Bay have been polluted to such an extent that they cannot harvest. So the shellfish beds have fed the Cowichan people for thousands of years. We have not been able to harvest that from that area for the last 40 years. Now that's a bad news story. It is still a beautiful river. And uh, we have thousands of people that actually travel to this river because there are parts of it that are extremely still uh, beautiful and wild. And it's um, some absolutely great fishing and uh, kayaking area. Uh, but as we get into the coastal, uh, the um, lower floodplain here and just around the corner from where we're at here, uh, this is the river coming down. This is the railway bridge. This is where we're sitting right here. Um, and if you're on the tour, uh, this is a significant gravel deposit area. Uh, and we actually, um, in conjunction with Cowichan tribes and North Cowichan and Duncan, we actually did a major excavation to allow for uh, flood mitigation strategies. But over the decades, we took this wild river and we channeled it, we diked it, and uh, we actually changed its course. Uh, this used to be the south fork of the Cowichan River and it actually went all the way down to the Coke Sila River. And decades ago, we chose to cut that off and actually force the whole river through here. We also have uh, built our communities in the floodplain, but not only in the floodplain, uh, we added um, pollution challenges. Um, our sewage treatment plants, lagoons, we have two sets of lagoons, not only for North Couch and Duncan Couch and Tribes and Couch and Bay and Glenora, uh, but we also have lagoons serving the community of Lake Cowichan. Fortunately, those lagoons nowadays are extremely uh, effective means of treating. Uh, the effluent is at a tertiary level. However, the mandate is we need to take this uh, effluent pipe out of the river and um, discharge it into another body of water. In 1956, uh, we took a wild lake and we put a reservoir on it to feed an economic giant in our community, the Catalyst Crops and Pulp and Paper Mill. And uh, this weir, um, and if you haven't had a chance to go up there, this is the weir itself. It's 97 centimeters tall. Uh, this is an island, and this is the gates that allow for the um, uh, water to flow through if it's not going over the weir, and this is um, a boat lock. So we raised the um, river, uh, sorry, the lake 97 centimeters to simply, basically, to ensure that there was adequate flow of water to feed the Croft and Pulp and Paper Mill, but also to ensure there was a minimum of seven cubic meters a second of water in the river at all times to allow for appropriate fish habitat. However, two things have changed for us. Uh, climate change, of course, uh, and one of the reasons why the Cowichan water Watershed Board is here, largely, is due to climate change. Population explosion, if you aren't aware of it, we crossed the 7 billion population mark in the world last year. In 1812, we were 800,000 people in this world. 1912, we were 1 1.6 billion people in this world. And in the last century, we just literally exploded. And it's interesting that our population growth in the couch and it has actually um, matched that was happening in the rest of the world. Now, if you go to central British Columbia, which a lot of you are from, clear evidence of climate change. The mountain pine beetle uh, devastation of our interior forests. Pretty graphic. Our climate change has been far more subtle. Uh, since the 1956, this river has been measured and monitored very carefully, and the summer inflows have changed dramatically. What this graph is demonstrating since 1956 is there's 35% less water coming into our system in the summer months of June, July, and August. Sorry, June through September, four months, June, July, August, and September than there was 50 years ago. I'm sorry, I'm just going to take a little bit of time with this slide. It's a little difficult to read, but um, these bar graphs indicate the number of days in a year that we do not 
allow for seven cubic meters of second of water, adequate river flow in the river. This is 1984, it's kind of a magical year for us. You can see the zeros here. That means there wasn't a single day, there was enough water coming into the system that we had seven cubic meters, seven cubic meters per second every single day that year. A couple worrisome times here in the mid 70s, uh, sorry, late 70s, early 80s. But most of this time, we had a few days, 32 days that we didn't make it. By the way, the blue lines means it just dropped one meter per second. It was six to seven. The yellow means we were down to five or six cubic meters per second. The brown line means we were down to four or five cubic meters per second. You can see over the years that not only have we got an increasing number of years, which we are not zero, but we also have an increasing number of years where the number of days that we're not making that has increased dramatically. What we're having is rain events that are changing because of, of uh, climate change. We're having drier summers and wetter winters. <laughs> Basically the same level of precipitation, but we have a change of the occurrence of that precipitation. So 2003 was a drought year for us, and it was a drought year across British Columbia. It was a catalyst for change in British Columbia, uh, because not only was the Cowichan affected by that drought, but uh, communities all across, across central and southern British Columbia. Our lit river low was at a critical, our river was at a critical low level, the worst in history in my memory. Crofton Pulp and Paper was uh, within six days of being closed down. What it was is that the reservoir, the lake, had got to a level that it was actually going to run dry. The problem with you have insufficient flow for an especially extended period of time, you have requirements for pollu um, diluting pollution. That was a threat to our health issues. For the first time in our history, we had to truck salmon up the river, Chinook, to the spawning grounds. And also in this crisis is that um, Roger, wherever Roger is, <coughs> uh, he's used a phrase to, um, or coined the phrase quite some time ago about peak government. And the fact that uh, sometime about 1996, the provincial government had reached its ability to uh, continue its past practices and expand. In fact, they, they have been retreating from their traditional um, services. We have five different levels of provincial, or five different departments or ministries that overs have some type of oversight. Who do you call when you have such a crisis? <coughs> and there's a recognition by the stakeholders in this valley that we needed to step up to the plate and we had to do create a plan. A whole pile of people got together. A fair amount of money was spent on this. It took three years to actually get the plan together. The Cowichan Basin water management plan. <coughs> we had another crisis in 2006 before it was completed. Another dry year, another year that we actually had to uh, truck fish up the river. The plan, I'm not going to go into this, it had uh, a vision. <coughs> Six goals, 23 objectives, 89 actions, and the goals are pretty common sense. We got to use less water, we got to increase the storage or increase the ability to ensure adequate flows in the river. We need to protect the agricultural system, ecosystems. We've got a problem with flooding, and by the way, before we actually started uh, implementing this plan, 2009, we had a flood. We had to do a lot of research, and we also had to come up with a way for better local governance or watershed governance. So I want to just give you some uh, key characteristics. Just want to remind you, 2003, we responded to a crisis, low flow year. 2006, we had another low flow year. 2009, we had a flood. By the time this plan was adopted in 2000, 2007, we didn't actually have the political will to actually start implementing the plan until the beginning of 2010, until we had the flood in November 2009. 
One of the most beautiful things about our initiative, it is truly a child, not only of Cowichan Valley Regional District, but of Cowichan Tribes. I was not part of that original gathering of minds, but Chief Lydia Whitsum, who you heard from yesterday, and um, Chair Jerry Giles of the Cowichan Valley Regional District, <coughs> they got together. people like Roger Hunter and said, how do we go forward? And uh, part of it is that uh, we're going to create an entity, but we need to have some funding. And so uh, from the beginning, Couch and Tribes committed $20,000 a year, and the CVRD has committed $50,000 a year. Not a lot of money. But over the years, we've been fortunate is that um, the regional district has provided over $500,000 of our gas tax <coughs> money to help us with our work. The Watershed Board recognized it just can't be local. We need the help and the support and the wisdom of the uh, federal and provincial governments. We need the key players from around the valley. However, the original plan called for, and I think Chief Lydia Whitson spoke to this yesterday, kind of an interest board. However, it evolved to a truly a governance board with the interest stakeholders actually uh, acting as a technical advisory committee to it. And in 2013, just a few months ago, we actually became a registered society. And for the sole purpose of that is to help harness the resources of the communities and people that wanted to actually give to a society to help us do our work that wouldn't uh, be able to give it to a local government or to the Cowichan tribes. Uh, so we are of uh, membership of the Cowichan tribes and it has been co-chaired from the beginning uh, by the chair of the CB, sorry, myself as chair of the CBRD and also the chief of the Cowichan tribes. Uh, we have two members appointed from Cowichan tribes. We have four, three members from the CVRD, uh, one from Canada, uh, DFO, Area Director Andy Thompson, who's going to be speaking later. We have at-large members. We have um, MOE, actually didn't want to appoint somebody from their ministry, but they um, nominated two individuals, Dr. Lona Mead and David Slade, to uh, sit at our table. And we also have the um, uh, special advisors and a very, very powerful technical advisory committee. <coughs> Our purpose simply is to implement the watershed plan, is to provide leadership and direction for managing <coughs> the watershed and to engage communities. We do not have authority. We give wisdom, advice, we do the homework to motivate others that do have the authority to do the right thing. How do we claim to be legitimate and accountable? It's because every person you saw on that governance board is either an elected official or they're appointed by an elected official or body. We are accountable to the Cowichan tribes and we're accountable to the CVRD. Somebody asked a question yesterday about consensus decision making. I've lived for 20 years, 21 years, as mayor of the town of Ladysmith and also in the regional district where we use Robert's Rules of Order and its majority vote wins. It's actually designed, I don't think, for the best decision making. It's designed for quick decision making. Let's get on with business. One of the most powerful things that we have in our governance board, and I, I can't remember and I can be uh, <coughs> reminded differently, but I can't remember where we had a major issue. And part of the, our process for decision making is we make sure everybody's on the same page. Everybody has the same education before the question is called. And it's an amazing process. It may take a little longer. Somebody alluded to yesterday that it actually makes a weaker decision making process. I sincerely believe what I've witnessed over the last four years is a stronger, because every single person has bought into it because they have an understanding. <laughs> uh, we meet on a monthly basis, uh, and as I said, education is the key. There is probably not a single meeting where we do not have some specialist, some individual or agency uh, educating us on one aspect or another of governance or watersheds or the, as or the many elements in the within the watershed. 
As I said before, we are not a regulatory, uh, we have no regulatory authority. We do work on a basis of collaboration and cooperation. We spend most of our time doing research, developing the action plan, and making sure that our recommendations, either to the couch and tribes, MOE, DFO, or CVRD, or member municipalities, is the best it can be. Uh, we facilitate community education. We've had a lot of forums and opportunities to do that. We have been advocating for the last four years for the best practices because, as you know from our history, we have not had the best practices in our valley. And we are committed to science. So we took those objectives and goals from that original plan and, and we said, you know what, we've got to make them more user-friendly and we actually turned them into targets. And what a simple target it is to sell to the community. Wouldn't it be nice if we could harvest the shellfish from Cowichan Bay by 2020? We took that as a target. In order to do that, we had to actually find out what's causing the pollution in Cowichan Bay. And it's not the effluence from the lagoons. There was some suspicion that it was, but in uh, collaboration with the MOE and a host of volunteers, this is just to give you one example of the work we've done, we took samples throughout Cowichan Bay, Coxala River, and Cowichan, and Cowichan River. And we actually had to do a fair amount of scientific analysis to determine that the source of those fecal chloroforms were actually largely from the farming community, the dairy farming community, of Cherry Point, Cowichan Bay, Bench Road area. And their practice of actually disputing the manure on their fields close to the creeks and the ditches that fed into Cowichan Bay was a serious issue. So armed with that knowledge, members of our board and, board and people like Roger Hunter took that knowledge to the farming community and said, we got a problem here. One of the reasons why we can't harvest shellfish in Cowichan Bay is because of your farming practices. We have a problem with water consumption. We've always had an abundance of water in this valley, but now we don't. I would love to be able to say that all our communities are metered and they all have a pricing system based on block rate, increasing block rate. It's a simple target meter every single water user and make sure they're playing appropriate price for that incredible resource. One of the challenges that we have, I think that we have over 1,100 wells punched into this aquifer. And as you know, we have no regulatory authority. The province has any regulatory authority over monitoring groundwater sources. They're gonna be doing that with the new legislation. We're actually saying lower the bar, regulate more users. One of our biggest efforts is to do with the actual lake itself. As you can see from climate change, we have a problem with the flows in the river, 2003, 2006, 2012, and the fact that we have no snowpack and limited rain in the last four months. We're very fearful what's gonna happen this year. But in 2003, the stakeholders said, you gotta do two things. You gotta raise the weir and you gotta put pumps why do you have to do both? Raising the weir in a low flow year like this isn't gonna guarantee you sufficient water storage. If we have a low flow year that the weir is actually empty or the water behind the weir is so low, we actually have to put in pumps to ensure we have adequate water flow. Those are not cheap. To raise the weir is estimated to be about $3 million. To put in pumps is estimated to be $5 million. So in the meantime, we're doing two things. We're trying to uh, use this weir a little bit better. We can actually adjust these gates and use these gates so we can actually hold back just 10 centimeters more of water. 10 centimeters of water is like 10 more days in September of good flow. Um, however, for the first time in our history, we actually have to defend at the Environmental Appeal Board this spring uh, six landowners are saying 
We don't like the fact that you're holding back 10 more centimeters of water. Couch and Tribes endorsed last year, and the CVRD are going to be asked to endorse next month, actually asking for a license this fall, this, uh, this summer, to actually hold back 20 centimeters. Now, it's only a value if there's water inflow, adequate inflow coming in. We have a longer term issue. We've got to raise the weir, as I said, or install pulps, <coughs> uh, pumps. And uh, one of our challenges is it's got to be a lot of work. And I just want to show you quickly some of the work that we've been do doing. And so this is not, as John O'Riordan said, just feel good stuff. This is important work in order to get that uh, supply, adequate supply there. And if it, we weren't doing this work, there would be nobody else doing this work. Um, some of the gas tax money we have spent on uh, mapping. There's 802 property owners around Lake Cowichan, and we have mapped every single property. Uh, just this is a red line is a 200-year floodplain. This is the average high water mark, uh, December, January, February. So typically, that's where the water is. The green line is where the height of the weir is. The weir is for summertime water retention. The yellow line is that if we actually took the weir and raised it 30 centimeters, that would be the impact. You can see for the most part here, there's a considerable, considerable spread between raising the weir 30 centimeters and the mean high water mark, which all the property owners typically enjoy or experience this time of year. We actually mapped every lot line. So you can see this is the actual ownership of the property. Here is the yellow. Here is the 200 meter, uh, sorry, 200 year floodplain. You'll notice that not a good location for a house. There's the high water mark. It's actually the high water mark. That means in a typical year, the high, these properties are actually engulfed for three months of the year. Here is the weir, and here's the weir plus, plus 30. This type of information was circulated to every single property owner just in our efforts. Actually, this was adjusted to 10 centimeters when we went for the 10 centimeter lift. The other thing we did is that um, we want to find out the impact of drawing down the lake. And so fortunately with uh, DFO, uh, our partnership with DFO, we did some bathymetry and I just want to show you a fabulous video. Now, we're not actually going to use the deep sea, <laughs> deep sea, deep lake pictures as part of the bathymetry. The bathymetry is to show people the impact of drawing down the lake, which might be a meter off their property or near their property, but also the impact in the repairing areas. But this is a pretty powerful video, and I hope it will work. And we discovered there was no locomotive in the bottom of Lake Cowichan. Lake Cowichan, I think, is uh, on average 150 meters deep. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last four years. Uh, we have been also lobbying the provincial government for some help. Uh, what do we wish for? And I think uh, Polis and others have um, stated some very similar principles. We want a, a greater role, local role in decision making that are affecting our own watersheds. We want to actually draw down some powers from the provincial and the federal governments and the authority and the ability to implement those powers. We don't have access at this time to long-term sources of revenue. And if we're gonna actually undertake the work that needs to do, to be done, to restore this watershed and make it a better place, um, we need long-term funding. We need appropriate regulations for groundwater and I'm fearing what's coming forward is not appropriate enough. We need promotion of conservation, not only by residents, but by commercial and indus ind industry. And we need the provincial and, and federal government not to step away 
but actually continue to play a major oversight role, especially in providing the resources for that scientific research that all the watersheds in British Columbia need. I think I took a little longer than I should have, but uh, thank you very much, and I hopefully I've told part of the story, and other gifted uh, part uh, members of our watershed board will help out also. Thank you, Rob. I'll just call upon uh, Larry George here to give the Cowichan tribe's perspective. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I, I do just want to make, a, I guess, one or two quick responses to, to Rob. I, I, that was a great overview. And from my recollection, I don't think there's been any, been any big issues at our table as well. I, I think, you know, we've had our disagreements, but we've worked through them, and, but there's been no major hindrances along the way. Um, so from Couch and Tri's point of view, uh, we have been involved from the start, as, as Rob outlines. Uh, previous Chief Wixom um, uh, started the process with, with some of our staff. And th there were smaller projects that brought the local governments together. So I, I think that was a good segue to, to the watershed board. Uh, some of the things I want to touch upon from my, from Couch and Drive's point of view is, you know, how we see how things are going and some of the things we would like to see happen. But I, I guess before I go further, I, I, I do need to let my colleagues know and, and, and Roger know that just as we sat down uh, for this session, I was I was approached, and I, I, I do need to go do some cultural work. And um, so, with my presentation, I will turn it over to Katkaleno to, to sit in for sit in for me for the question and answer period. So I do apologize for that. Uh, but from Couch and Tribes' point of view, you know it's been mentioned by tribes and by other First Nations that. Uh, there still is rights and titles that are unresolved, and it's the same here in the Cowichan Valley. They're, they are unresolved. But as we have been hearing for the past couple of days, we cannot stop. There is still a lot of work that has to be done, and we need to keep moving. So I, I think we're all prepared to do that. And you know, we've we've heard it a number of times. Ag as well, this past couple of days, uh, we feel the current process is not the best for for communities. And like Rob said, you know some of those powers need to be shared, passed down, whatever the process is. You know, there needs to be some local control on that, and we feel this is the best the best option and that this needs to begin soon. So, so with the watershed boards, um, you know, as, as our, our chiefs and political leaders, as well as our technicians, you know, we're all guided by, uh, by our elders and the knowledge and philo philosophy they bring with them, with their experiences and and by them listening to, to other people, you know, this has shaped us and, and taught us, you know, the connection that we need to have with, with our land and territory. Uh, you know, as we heard, you know, water is, is a lifeline for each and every one of us. And, you know, if we don't start taking care of it now, it, it's going to be very difficult for, you know, for our children and grandchildren, and that we need to, you know, maybe experience what what Marlowe presented. You know, have that connection with the land, you know, that real connection 
with the land and um, you know spends a night or five nights or you know whatever it takes for you to 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 come to that state of mind and you know some of the reminders that that we hear and you know I'm, I'm not I'm not fluent in our language but you know there's some words that continue to echo at all of our meetings from from our elders and you know they stand up and they remind us they say Mukstam I Itana Tamo Oho Litan Mukstam I Itano Tamo O Tlihok Al So a you know a true translation can't be made but um, into English that is but the the, the closest that it comes to is everything on this earth is what sustains us everything on this earth is connected together you know so so with those types of words and thinking you know it, it's going to take time and understanding for us to to move towards that you know there's been a lot of work as as rob has highlighted you know that has shown strengths and weaknesses, you know, which has led to some plans and planning that needs to be done. You know, all of this discussion brings us and keeps us at the table and, and what it does is it starts to build the strength, it starts to establish relationships and, you know, as those build then, you know, it opens the door for, for taking the, the next steps that need to happen, you know, which will lead to a, a, a real true partnership. So, so with those steps, you know, we, we, we can all say that, you know, Couch and Tribes, North Couch and CBRD, the various levels of government, you know, we, we are going to, you know, unite. We're going to to work to to achieve some common goals. You know, even though there's a lot of unanswered questions on the table, but we, you know, we can't afford to wait. Uh, there's, you know, crises. There's issues that go on every year in in all of our communities and. And you know, Rob highlighted just the ones that happened here with the flooding and the droughts, and you know, a good portion of our, of our community is, is flooded every year. Um, you know, a lot of times our members have to be picked up by boat and, and brought somewhere to stay. Um, you know, the drought is, is causing a lot of concern, especially with with the crisis we're having with salmon and especially Chinook. You know, like, like Rob mentioned, the Chinook run used to make headlines in, in London. And now, you know, we're talking of numbers of 500, you know, 1,500. And every once in a while, we jump up to 5,000 per year. And during one of those last droughts, you know, through our department, you know, we, we took a, a really bold step and, and closed the whole river to any food fish harvest to all of our community members. Um, you know, we, we definitely weren't the most popular people in, in the territory. Uh, and, but you know, people still survive o off the land. You know, people still go to the river and that's gonna be their meal for the day. And, you know, just like people used to go to the bay to, to harvest the shellfish and that was their food for the day and, and that's long gone. There's, 
between here and Ladysmith, there's probably two small beaches that people can harvest shellfish from. You know, so there's, but that's, that's why we can't afford to wait. We, we need to keep moving on. So, you know, there is a willingness for that partnership to develop. And some of the signs that are going to show that that is working, um, you know, there, there seems that consensus is, is something that everyone is willing to, to work with. And that's the way the watershed board is, is operating. And, you know, I, I can say from Cowton's point of view, we've, we've been very happy with, with, the, with a lot of those decisions that have been made. And, you know, we, we need to think of the whole community as, as how it's going to affect them and benefit them and not one particular group in, in we need to um, just remember that you know everything is important. You know everything is connected, and we rely on all of it. So you know we do need to listen to all of our people out there. I mean, we we just don't know who's going to have that particular piece of knowledge that's going to you know fit a few things together that's going to say, hey, that's what we need to do. And another good indicator is, you know, is there signs of relationship and trust building amongst all of the groups at, at the watershed table? You know, if that continues to grow, it's, it, it, it will show when we sit and talk about issues. Uh, we do, all have access to sources where we can gather information, you know, if that's from individuals or it's from written materials, you know, we need that to, to begin forming a foundation, which is gonna help us, you know, develop the goals. And, you know, once we reach these goals we have, then we'll, we'll have more goals to, to, to achieve then we can, you know, deal with, you know, the low or high flow issues that we have, the shellfish and the Chinook runs. You know, so, you know, we are looking at and expecting to move forward, you know, on, on a joint effort for, for, the, for water storage license. You know, you know we, we feel that that is going to benefit us here on in the watershed. So th that's a highlight of how Couch and Tribes has has felt about the watershed board, and you know we we look forward to um, continuing to work with this great group of people who have a vast range of experience and knowledge, and that. We are fortunate that you know we, we have some elders that are willing to, to sit and guide us on our side and that we continue to have the support from our leadership. Uh, so I will close with that and again, you know, apologize that I, I do need to step out. Haitsevka. Haitsevka, Larry. We'll now call on Andy Thompson. We'll now call on Andy Thompson to uh, <laughs> just talk about DFO and, and DFO's involvement in the benefits. Yeah, I'll be fairly quick. Um, uh, you'll be happy to hear, as a good government bureaucrat, I've only brought one slide, so it'll be nice for you. Uh, so I am Am Andy Thompson, the Area Director for South Coast BC for Fisheries and Oceans, which is uh, essentially I'm responsible for the operational programs on Vancouver Island and Sunshine Coast. And I was asked to come here today to talk about, you know, what's DFO's perspective on a local watershed uh, governance board. And so what I thought I'd bring forward is uh, the wisdom that I have as a fisheries biologist is it's pretty simple. Fish need water. Uh, so that is our role. 
So from my point of view, you know, it, when I took on my job two years ago, my, my predecessor sort of gave me the, the lay of the land and said, if you're going to spend some time in a lo local governance body, spend some time in the couch because it's really where they've got the, the ball uh, uh, already rolling in the right direction. And so from, the, you know, the story for why DFO is involved it can be seen in the graph on this slide. As L Rob's laid out and as Larry has laid out more eloquently than I can, we've seen some very significant declines in the couch and Chinook, which is a, a very important species for, uh, for the couch and tribes, very important for recreational fishermen all across BC, and also very important um, for the environment as well. Now, we've, we've had some uh, improvement in the last few years. I'm happy to say you can see, hopefully that's starting to be an upswing. But it's the impetus for why DFO is getting involved in these local governance pieces. It really is a chance for us to engage with our partners in conservation objectives. It's, it's very easy to get around a table with the people of the Couch and Watershed Board and others and, and come to a common consensus that we need to have healthy salmon runs for to support us all. Whether, it, whether you're from a recreational sector, from the tribes, or from the department's point of view. The board also helps to address issues that are beyond our mandate. The FO doesn't have a mandate around water rights. We need to have the, the assistance and benefits of, of the local governance structure as well as with the tribes in order to push some of our issues forward uh, in a collective basis that will benefit fish. Um, and it's also a, a chance for us to, uh, it works within our new structure that where we're guided by the wild salmon policy where we're we're bound by the policy to conserve the conservation units of, of wild salmon. And we have a, a structure in place for that, that that allows us to extract the knowledge at a local level. And so we hosted a workshop uh, um, uh, this past year in which we brought together local experts, uh, Cowlish and Tribes, uh, and also uh, some of our departmental experts to come to a uh, a common understanding about what are really the limiting factors for, for Cowlish and Chinook. And what can we do about these limiting factors? And so uh, we've been working uh, much more closely in the local community than we have in the past. And I think that's an improvement for the department. The other thing I was asked to reflect on is what's really unique about Couch and Water Board. I, as, uh, as area director, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with a lot of community groups. And I can tell you what's unique about the Couch and Water Board is, is very simply the people around the table. You've got a very a unique partnership of First Nations, the local government leaders and other technical and, and, and community representatives in, in that board that really do have the voices at the table. And that's so important because I've seen in other bar bodies that the voices get lost a little bit because you don't have the right people at the table. And that's it's a big plus for the Couch and Water Board. And the other big piece of this is having performance-based objectives. Whether it's to harvest shellfish in, the, in Couch and Bay or to have healthy sustaining runs, if you don't have an objective, you go to a meeting and you kind of spin your wheels. You need to set those goals and be, and be clear about, uh, about it around the table and then drive forward to them. I'm an inordinately impatient individual. It drives me nuts to sit in meetings and endlessly talk and not get anything done. This is a board that's actually working to get things done. As it really is a model that should be felt, followed elsewhere. So that's my perspective, but I'll turn it over to Thank you, Andy. I'm worried about that bell going, so uh, I'll just introduce you very quickly, Lorna. Please, Dr. Lorna Mintz. Thanks, Roger. So my task is similar to Andy's. It's to speak to um, why people coming in from a different frame of reference would want to be part of the College and Watershed Board, and also to um, to talk a little bit about some of the aspects that strike me as really uh, functional and really helpful. So w when I first was invited to join the board, I was working as the medical health officer for Island Health um, and uh, based in Nanaimo. And uh, one of the things that was really hard for me, and I'd been struggling with it for years, was trying to get climate change to come much more forward in the realm of public health. Um, 
it's better now, but at that time, I think we really didn't have the tools in public health to grasp it. So the discussions, when we did talk about climate change, looked at things like um, um, an increase in the presence of tropical infectious diseases or an increased mortality from the heat island effect in the large urban areas. And so it was little things that we were picking off. There wasn't any really kind of a holistic approach to it whatsoever. So it was a great um, pr treat for me to, to join this board and find that, um, that people mostly thought in an ecological way, in a very rounded, complex way. Whereas I had been coming at it from a very reductionist scientific point of view. And I d one of the uh, um, interesting parts about that was that um, I could work with people who um, helped kind of anchor that thinking and deepen it. Um, so for instance, Margot Parks, who is at this conference, uh, has been very helpful to me in helping me make the links between population health, ecosystem health, and climate change. And one of the other things I've learned is that you don't take climate change as one ginormous whole and expect to tackle it. You need to break it down into specific chunks. And so we have a very, very good example within the struggles in the pouch and watershed board around climate change. So it, it becomes manageable, workable, and people get it. So very, very satisfying from that point of view. I'll just give you an example of how my old public health reductionist thinking collided with the board's thinking. It was, uh, it was quite a lesson for me. We were busy setting targets for the board, and um, I was working with the members of the technical advisory committee on setting a public health target. And we looked at a number of possibilities, and these were just first-class intelligent scientists, scientists. They were just outstanding. And we talked around it, and we talked around it, and we talked around it, and we finally decided that we would say that we want the water to be potable, drinkable, at the end of the system, where the sandpipe comes up out of the ground. So we proudly took that back to the board, and the board just said, that doesn't do it. We want to hear about what's causing fish kills. We want to know about the septics up in the Lake Cowichan area. You need to rethink this. And so I was, I was stunned because that clean water coming out of the sandpipe is kind of a, a gold standard for public health. I mean, what more, what more could you want? But again, thinking in a reductionist term versus thinking in an ecosystem term, those were colliding. And um, fortunately, ecosystem thinking is winning for me. And uh, I think it's been part of the thinking of a lot of the people that sit on the watershed board anyway. So, um, I guess those are the two things that kind of really resonated for me in coming onto the board. I'm just going to comment briefly on a couple of the things that, that really make it um, inspiring and worthwhile to be involved with this work. Um, one of the things is, is the problem-solving approach that um, this board takes. Um, and the example is something that uh, was already alluded to, the farming community. And the fact that we did um, testing for bacteria in the water last, this last fall and the previous fall, and, and it became clear that, that the farms, some of them, were probably spreading their manure um, just around the time of the rainfall and it was washing in. And uh, we could have taken um, a regulatory approach to that, but after considerable discussion, it was decided that Roger and um, Wayne Haddo from Ministry of Agriculture and a couple of other people that were um, interested in engaging with the farmers would just go around and, and have a conversation and some gentle persuasion, perhaps. And, um, and some of us were thinking, oh, you really should be doing an enforcement thing. I mean, this isn't going to work, right? But they went around and they had very rewarding conversations with the vast majority of the people that they met with. There were a couple that were resistant and did not want to participate or do anything about it, but most of them were eager to make changes and to step up to the plate. So the, the best part of this, though, is that what they've done together, these farmers and these courageous folks from the board and TAC that went out to do the conversation, have started talking about an alternate way to resolve the issue of the manure going on the ground, and it's to use it 
um, in a kind of a biogas digester. I'm not sure where that's gone. But what I love about it is they've just, they've circled it one whole loop around and they've made a whole bunch of friends in the process. So, and that's kind of how the board works. It's just, it's quite, quite blessed. Okay, um, everybody has commented on the importance of the partnership between the CBRD and Cowichan tribes and that's also something that makes, that gives me deep satisfaction and uh, I'm really um, delighted that it works so strongly. And I think I'll probably just stop there and um, let you get on with it. Thanks, Lorna. David, you want to wrap it up? Thank you, Roger, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It was in this hall that we announced that the Cowichan was a heritage river years ago. And uh, ever since, especially that day, but ever since, people have been asking me, what is a heritage river? And if any of you know the answer, I'd like you to tell me, because I'm still puzzling over it but it does mean that the Cowichan is a very special river. Now, why have we been successful, as, as you've heard? Um, why are we so optimistic, as you've heard? Um, partly, uh, it's the uh, fact that we have emerged from a crisis. I think it was President Obama's um, first chief of staff who said you should never let a crisis go to waste. And since then, Mr. Obama may have had too many crises as to really appreciate the comment anymore, but nevertheless, it's true. We had a crisis on the Cowichan. People realized there had to be something done, and uh, Rob has explained what, uh, the, what was that. that. That's the first point. We, we have a driver there. Second point is we've had remarkable success with the co-chairs. Um, it's, of course, flattering, and, and Rob can put his hands over his ears, but we have had excellent chairing, and it has been very, very collegial. Um, of course, as we heard this morning, there are many issues with respect to uh, the, the, the ownership of resources and the responsibility for water, uh, but we're able to put that aside with the clear understanding that whatever the outcome of discussions on ownership and responsibility and, and legacy, nevertheless, you have to have something there. You can't destroy it in the, in the meantime while they're making up your mind as to who owns what. So that's been a very important issue as well. A third point that I'd like to mention is that um, we have been very uh, well aware of the technical, of the importance of technical information, and we've had, as you've heard, excellent technical information. If I could contrast that quickly to an issue going on in this, the, the capital regional district, the adjacent uh, the regional district, there you're having enormous debate, and it's going to go on forever, enormous expenditure, wasted expenditure, much of it because there is no agreement, no understanding, no acceptance of the quality of the technical information upon which the Capital Region District is making a series of very expensive decisions. Here, by contrast, we've had very good luck and enormously successful and competent technical people hel helping us. Now, I do not wish to um, suggest that, you know, this is the model for all of the Canadian or North American or, or other jurisdictions. We heard yesterday about the uh, Ontario uh, Conservation Authorities uh, from um, uh, Barbara, and it was um, really interesting that they had set up their original cycle back in the 40s, the original group, the circle that you saw on that slide, with representatives speaking on behalf of. Now, we, as you've heard, were very lucky not to have that. We are getting information from interests that may be affected, as you again heard, but we do not sit on that board to say, I'm here to represent only homeowners, I'm here to represent only uh, fishermen, I'm here to represent X, Y, or Z. Uh, that's been a very, very important issue, and it's not always possible to get a clear distinction, but that's one reason we have been successful, because people have been speaking on the, ver on the basis of the merit of argument and discussion of issues, rather than saying, well, I have to politically represent my constituency. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, the, 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 the um, Ontario Conservation Authority, I'd just like to mention two, uh, two quick things there as well. It was also mentioned that uh, you have, there are possible risks. There was a slide that said possible risks and downside to what they're doing. It's worth looking at, and we, we're gonna have to be very conscious of the fact that we don't want to become considered 
to be a fourth level, or sorry, a fifth level of government, another level of government with whom you have to work your way through to get anywhere. Um, okay, so that's really um, uh, an important factor, and also the um, um, the issue that came up uh, from um, uh, Ryan Plummer's talk uh, uh, on, on New Brunswick, where he talked about there is no single solution. I mean, I'm perhaps repeating myself here. Uh, we have a model that seems to work here for this river. It may not work everywhere else, and everything has to be adapted to local conditions. There is no blueprint that works uh, here, there, and everywhere. Now, one reason that, um, uh, that and if I could just finish on this, um, one reason that I think we've also been quite successful is we're filling a vacuum. Um, you know, this board was really set up because the provincial minister of forests uh, wasn't doing his job. That's a personal view of mine. But he wasn't taking, doing what I thought should be done, what others uh, thought should be done with respect to management of the Cowichan River. Because with the, 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 the issues of forestry in this area, um, his, his res responsibility was the wheel. Um, so we tended to fill a void. There was a need, and that's important from the local point of view. And this often happens with local groups getting together, local governments getting together, because a senior government is not doing what they should. Now, uh, the answer, of course, is to get the senior government to do, to do what it should. But in these days of downloading, uh, where budgets are being cut by senior governments right, left, and center, uh, it probably isn't realistic to say they're going to reverse that trend and start doing the things that we want. Um, those of you who think that Mr. Harper is going to uh, uh, reverse the trend of seven years and suddenly discover that he has to spend a lot of money on the environment, um, uh, well, I hope you're uh, the president of the Conservative Party because nobody, nobody else would believe it. And maybe you could influence Mr. Harper. The rest of us understand a policy has been made and a policy is continuing and it's unlikely to change. So there has to be someone else to fill in where something is not happening. I used to call this, when I was in politics, sort of oppor opportunistic um, uh, federalism. Um, if the province moved out of some area, the federal government should move in. If it was worth doing. If it wasn't worth doing, leave it. But that brings up the next thing. In addition to having um, a, a downloading from the federal government and the provincial government, you're also getting an offloading. Things are simply stopping not happening. And that's again why local organizations such as this board tend to move in. Now what then is the role of the, um, um, of, of the other levels of government? Because it is not simply a question of saying, let's do it locally. That's not quite good enough. There are many issues when the obvious one is fish, salmon, migratory salmon. How can a local Cowichan River based organization deal with the whole issue of interception of salmon stocks by Alaskans or by people on the west coast of Vancouver Island or people in the southern um, uh, Straits right around the Fuca. Not possible. So you do have to have uh, the involvement uh, of, of, of senior governments. And, and that, I think, is a particularly uh, important factor. Um, we have to um, um, have a, an analysis of what the senior governments do well, what they should continue to do, and what is better left at the local level. And it's a key question. Um, what is it um, that the senior governments can do to ensure the success of this board? Because if they opposed what the board might be doing, it would not be possible to do what we would like to do at the local level. Now, what do I suggest senior governments should do? First, setting clear, enforceable objectives and standards. That they are good at. Um, second, Inventory monitoring uh, the database and database maintenance. You need to have uh, ongoing long uh, range uh, uh, work by governments to do those things effectively. Third is research. Is it possible for all the research necessary to be done here? No, it's not. There'll be a lot of generic fisheries research, so just to think of that alone again, um, which will affect uh, salmon stocks coastwide and even indeed on the other side of the Pacific as well. Obviously, that's not the role of a local Cowichan-based uh, uh, body. Uh, compliance and enforcement. Uh, this group um, uh, is unlikely to have enforcement powers that would be as successful as the RCMP. Um, we have to realize that, that, that there are things that other governments may do better. Uh, then I would add it to that, you have to enable effective delegation and adequate funding mechanisms 
Rob mentioned the importance of funding, and it's not just Rob, there was others as well, the Okanagan, uh, and it and, and, uh, was mentioned uh, when they were discussing Okanagan uh, Basin Authority, um, and also that this was true for Ontario as well. Very, very large budget. You must have continuous funding. Otherwise, organizations such as ours fall into the trap of short-term funding, and an immense amount of energy is used up in trying to generate it from a wide variety of sources. Uh, that funding can be provided by the, um, by the uh, senior governments. So, just to sum up, unlikely that there's going to be a reversal of this current trend of downloading and offloading. Thus, more important that we continue with the type of thing that we're trying to do in the Cowichan. However, remember, that is not the model for all. It has to be adapted, it has to be adjusted, and we in turn, remember, have been particularly lucky with the cooperative attitude of both the Cowichan Valley Regional District and the Cowichan Tribe. Uh, it won't work everywhere, but it works here so far, so, uh, so very, very well, and we hope that we will be able to report at future meetings like this some future successes. Thank you very much.